Thank you so much. Would you stand with me today as we get ready to read the text for the Palm Sunday message today? Again, welcome to the Fountain of Life on this Palm Sunday, everyone in the house and, and everyone that's watching online. I do believe that the word of the Lord will speak to us today. Now, in most churches on Palm Sunday, you can pretty much predict the script. The sermon will focus on the triumphant entry, people waving palm branches and Jesus riding into the city on a donkey. They'd be crying, Hosanna, which means save us. And they would be saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. A little bit of a misstep there. He didn't just come in the name of the Lord. He was the Lord. They shouted, Hosanna. Pretty much, most pastors will talk about that today. As we mark the one year that, of the fire that destroyed our church, some people would call it a house of worship, some a church, others a temple. I have a different kind of a Palm Sunday message today, but don't worry, it's gonna come right up your street. Here it is, fire is not the only thing that can destroy a temple. The title of this message is More Than a Building. And today we're gonna see a very different, surprising, perhaps even a shocking side of Jesus. Here we go, the parade is over, the hosannas are done, the palm branch waving has been finished, everybody's gone back home. And in Mark chapter 11, I will begin reading with verse 11. This is the night of the first, that Palm Sunday. Here it is, Jesus entered Jerusalem and he went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the 12. The next day, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. He cursed the fig tree and the disciples heard him say it. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts. He began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, is it not written, my house will be called the house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of thieves. Wow, a different side of Jesus. Flipping tables, chasing money changers out, doves and pigeons flying out of their cages, animals running out of the place. But Jesus came to Jerusalem with a laser-like focus. And everything that would happen in Holy Week from the night of Palm Sunday through Good Friday, the crucifixion, every act he did had significance. And the fig tree and the temple has great significance to us today. And Father, I pray that as this word crosses over this holy desk and touches our hearts, would you show us that we are the temple of God. That the temple is more than a place, but it is a person. And how you wanna work and move inside our temple so that we might bear fruit and bring glory to God our Father. Would you speak to our hearts today, Lord? Let it not just be another sermon or another teaching, but with the Holy Spirit do some surgery in our lives today, in the name of Jesus, I pray, amen. Let everybody say amen. amen. Turn to your neighbor and say neighbor. neighbor. Say neighbor. neighbor. Get ready, get ready, get ready. You may be seated, everybody in the house. Listen, the first, everybody get, get seated, then I'll just give you a minute to sit down. The first three things Jesus did associated with Palm Sunday are disruptive. I know we don't usually 
look at Jesus as disruptive. We just like to look at him as a kind, handsome Jew holding a baby lamb and teaching nice teachings and helping people that are hurting. The first three things he did were disruptive. And the first thing he did was assert his authority. Now, I didn't go back far enough into the text, but remember, he told his disciples, go into the town and you're gonna see a colt tied there. I want you to untie that colt and bring him to me. And if anybody objects, you just tell them the Lord needs him. So they went and did exactly what the Lord said and they brought the colt to Jesus. The second thing he did was he cursed the fig tree because it had no fruit. The third thing he did was he cleansed the temple. Now the cursing of the fig tree and the cleansing of the temple are really prophetic. Now walk with me. They point directly toward us. The fruitless fig tree represents more than Jesus' disappointment that there was no breakfast on the tree. That's not what's going on here. Yes, Jesus was physically hungry for some fruit, you know, a fig to eat, but he was also looking for spiritual fruit from his people. And he was upset that there was no fig there to eat, but it's so much deeper than that. His people had an appearance of religion, but there was no fruit in their lives. Then he proceeds to the temple. And you will notice when Jesus is in the temple, what does he call it? He calls it my house. See, the temple was the dwelling place for God. In the Old Testament, the temple was the dwelling place of God. Let's establish the first thought I wanna share with you today. A temple is a place for God to dwell. Let's all say it together. A temple is a place for God to dwell. Let's back up a few hundred years. In the Old Testament, when they were at Mount Sinai, God gave Moses his instructions to set up a tabernacle. They called it the tent of meeting. It's there that they would bring sacrifices and it's there that God's presence would literally at times come down and fill that tabernacle, that tent of meeting and people the people would stand in awe of a holy God. His presence would be a consuming fire. But the tabernacle in the Old Testament, it was a dwelling place for God. And it's so interesting that the tent of meeting was placed right in the center of the camp. In other words, the 12 tribes of Israel surrounded it and God instructed Moses, put the tabernacle, put the tent of meeting right in the center, which speaks of the centrality of Christ. Listen, when you come to faith in Jesus, he doesn't just become part of your life, he comes to be the center of your life. Amen to that. See, that's radically different than Jesus becoming a part of your life and him being the center of your life. Now, God would tell the Jewish people that in the future, when they get into the promised land, they would find a permanent location and build a permanent structure. That place would be Jerusalem. David would gather the materials. Solomon, his son, would actually build the temple. And I love what Deuteronomy says. It says, God will put his name there. Don't miss this. <laughs> God will put his name there for his dwelling. So when Jesus said, my house, the tabernacle was his house. In the wilderness for those 40 years, it was his house. And when Solomon built that great temple, nothing ever been built like it before or since. The temple that Solomon built, it was God's house to dwell in. But the tabernacle and the temple were both prophetic of a new kind of temple. I don't know if you heard what I said. I said the tent of meeting in the wilderness and the temple built by Solomon were both prophetic of a new kind of temple. And here's what it would look like after the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Everyone, somebody say everyone. Every individual who places their faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ that finished work is his death, his burial, his resurrection. Everyone, somebody shout everyone. Everyone who puts their faith in the finished work of Jesus becomes the temple of God. 
And when you get a revelation of that, it's a game changer in your life. I just don't go to church to meet God. No, he has come to dwell in our lives. And that blows my mind that a holy God would make a way to come and dwell in the hearts of men. And that ought to make you shout from here to eternity. That God is not a faraway God in a faraway place. But when you come to faith in Jesus, he comes into your spirit. Because man is more than hair. Well, man is more than a physical structure with bones and muscle. He is a spirit. He has a soul. He is made in the image of God. What's that mean? In the image of God. Do you look like him? No. Do I? No. We're made in the image of God because he is eternal and he has given you an eternal spirit. And you're going to live forever. I said, you're going to live forever. Heaven, hell, but you're going to live forever. And I thank God that he loved us so much that he wanted to come like he did in the tabernacle in the Old Testament, like he did in the temple of Solomon. He actually dwelt his presence came in, God's presence came in. First Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Let me read this for you. Do you not know your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Somebody shout amen right there. <laughs> Whom you have from God and you are not your own. You were bought at a price. And let me pause right there, that price was the blood of Jesus. Therefore, since Jesus bought you, since he paid the price to own your life, to make a way for him to come in, because he cannot dwell in sin, so he had to purify you with his blood. Now he comes in to your life. Therefore, since he did all that, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now the temple is not a place, but a person. Say amen out loud to that. My God, I feel this. The temple is not a place. It's a person. Listen, Acts seven forty eight says this. The most high does not dwell in temples made with hands. If I was to read more of that scripture, it says, heaven is my throne. Watch this. God said, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Who will build a house for me? What, what he's really saying is, if, if the heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool, what kind of building are you going to put me in? If heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool, what kind of building are you trying to fit me into? No, he does not dwell in buildings made with hands. He come to dwell in the hearts of the people that he loved, that he bought and paid for their redemption. I love Ephesians chapter two, verse 21 and 22. We are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. In him, in him, you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God. You are a dwelling place for God. Don't miss this. You're being built together. So every one of us who are followers of Jesus, if you are a committed follower of Jesus, you have put faith in his finished work, say amen out loud. You individually are a temple of God, but it goes deeper than that. We together. I said we together. As the family of God are being built up into a holy temple for God to dwell. That's why, that's why, <laughs> and I don't mean to make light of it, we, we lost our building, but we didn't lose the dwelling place. We lost a building, but God doesn't dwell in buildings. We lost a building, but we did not lose the dwelling place. I am 
a dwelling place. We are, you are, we are a dwelling place for God. That's why when we come together, don't come here with some flippant mindset. When you come here, we're a dwelling place for God. He can save you. He can deliver you from your addiction. He can heal your sick body and set you free. He can do the impossible because wherever God is, the impossible becomes possible. When we come to church, when we come to gather like this, it's not just a few songs, a sermon, and putting some money in a bucket. We're coming is the body of Jesus, a dwelling place of God for God. And he can do mighty things in our midst when we gather together in Jesus' name. Whether there's a building or not, we are the people of God. We are the temple of God. And when you understand that you are a temple of the Holy Spirit, that God has come into your life to dwell, it will change how you live. It will change how you worship. You know, sometimes I, I, I could get a kick, if, kick out if God would just like manifest himself. You know how man does his deeds in the dark? We go into the room and maybe we're with some people, we're doing some things we shouldn't be doing and we shut the door and turn out the light. Don't you know God? If you're a follower of Jesus, because sometimes followers of Jesus do some stupid things. And we sometimes indulge in things we should not indulge in. Sin, things we should not do. I just wish one time when you shut the door and shut off the light, God would flip it back on and go, I'm here. I know you think you left me at the church, but don't you know I come to dwell in your body and what you're about to do with it? You're about to go to bed with somebody you're not married to, don't you know I'm in there too? If we would understand that the temple is more than a building, it's your body, we might hesitate before we suck on a joint. We may pause before we get drunk. We may stop before we get between the sheets with somebody we shouldn't be there with. Because God is not left at the church. He's in your temple. Temple, I said, my first thought is a place for God to dwell. Number two, my second thought is this. A temple is a place of prayer and true worship. Everybody say that with me now. A temple is a place for prayer. Come on, out loud. A temple is a place of prayer and true worship. Does that actually mean, do you think, that your body, your temple, your life should be a house of prayer? Thank you for those three yeses. Don't you believe then, if your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, there ought to be prayer, and not just prayer, but true worship that comes up out of your being? The temple here that I read about that Jesus went to cleanse had become anything but a house of prayer. Their worship had become lifeless and mechanical. It went on and on, week after week, month after month, year after year, with no real heart connection to God. Hit the brakes. I know we're probably thinking, I can't believe that. How could they be in that temple and bring their sacrifices and bring their tithes and their heart be far from God? It happens to us as well. There is a danger for all of us to get into the rhythm of religion. Let me say it again, we can get into the rhythm of religion. And we can come to church week after week on Sunday and then live the rest of our lives as though we hadn't even been to church. Walk with me. Isaiah said this, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Jesus went into that temple that they had turned into a marketplace. There was corruption, no love, Human greed was the order of the day, and it was all formality. And there was no heart connection to God. And if we're not careful, we can fall into the same trap. Come to church on Sunday, 90 minutes, two hours, whatever that might be. And just go home and act like we didn't go to church at all. John chapter four, verse 23, Jesus said these words, but the time is coming and now is 
when the true worshipers, somebody say the true worshipers, worshipers. does that mean there could be false worship? True worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. And so much of what the church today calls worship isn't really worship at all. I'm hoping you come back next week. So much of what the Christian church today calls worship really isn't worship. It's song singing. Let me tell you where I'm going. We think worship is singing songs, putting our hands in the air, getting excited, jumping around. Singing songs is part of it, but it's not the totality of it. Totality of it. True worship is living a life of obedience to God. Let me say it again. True worship is living a life that's in obedience to God in the secret place where there's no crowd, where the lights are off and there's no band, there's no fanfare. True worship is turning your back on sin when your flesh wants it. It's giving it up. It's denying yourself what Jesus called us to do. He said, if you want to follow me, deny yourself because yourself is going to get you into a world of hurt. He said, deny yourself, pick up your cross and, and follow me. When you are tempted strongly to sin and it knocks on all of our doors and don't think it don't knock on mine. Sin will knock on every one of our doors. And when we're tempted strongly to sin, when the desire is strong within you, but you do not give in, you choose to obey God, that is pure worship to God. If you choose to indulge in sin, I'm I'm not talking about, listen, I'm not talking about being perfect. I'm not talking about slipping up. Everybody slips up. How many slipped up since last Sunday? Lord, only about a third of them raised their hand, which means the other two thirds is lying. So I'm asking you to cause the spirit of truth to sweep across this church. In Jesus' name. How many of you messed up somehow in the last week? Thank you, Lord, for hearing and answering my prayer right here, right now. Amen. I'm not talking about messing up, making a mistake. I'm talking about choosing to indulge in sinful lifestyles. I'll tell you what, you can come in here on Sunday morning, sing the songs, raise your hands, jump up around, spin around, turn around, and raise your hands in the air like you just don't care, and the devil's laughing at you. And God is not impressed. Don't call what you do on Sunday worship. If you have hatred in your heart towards another image bearer of God. I mean, come in here and sing the songs, but the church, the Christian church today has gotten it twisted. We think that's worship. It's part of worship, but, but, but don't call what you do on Sunday worship if you have hate in your heart. Don't call it worship if you go home and hate your neighbor. Don't call what you do on Sunday worship if you have prejudice towards someone of another color. Don't call it worship if you're bitter towards another brother or sister. You know what Jesus said? If you if you got a problem with another brother or sister and you come with an offering, call it tithes, kingdom builders, or a song, lay it down, bro. And go be reconciled to your brother. Don't call it worship if you curse all week and come in here sing, blessed be the name of the Lord. Don't call it worship if you're shacked up with someone you're not married to. Jesus was very disruptive the day after Palm Sunday. And sometimes we need him to disrupt our life. God is not always going to tell you, even through the preacher, how wonderful you are and pat you on the back. I said at the beginning of the message, fire is not the only thing that can destroy a temple. Because no worship or false worship can destroy the temple. Don't fool yourself. You're not going to hear this anywhere else. Jesus was certainly not patting the Jewish people on the back when he went into the temple. Let me pause. This is not 
feels a little hard, but some of us need to be awakened because I think that we've been, we've been intoxicated by the love and the grace of Jesus that we think we can indulge in sin and it doesn't matter. Let me just pause. The, the nation of Israel was to be a nation of kings and priests. There was to be a, priest, a, a, a kingdom of priests that would demonstrate the glory of God to the other nations. I'm, I said, this is why Jesus was so angry. And by the way, I say anger, but I'm not sure it was anger. Because right before he rolled the donkey into Jerusalem, right before he came in, he wept over the city. Do you remember that? He wept over the city. I'm not sure what he did to the fig tree because there was no fruit or what he did in the temple was anger. Maybe it was out of a broken heart because he had set up a nation, a kingdom of priests, of Jewish people, so that they would demonstrate the glory of God to other nations. Fast forward to us, what do you think God wants to do with you and me? To raise us up as a light, a city set on a hill to be the salt of the earth and, 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 the, and the water that will satisfy the thirsty and the light of the world. He is, he's called us to be his priests that we might demonstrate to a world gone mad the glory of Christ. And how can we demonstrate the glory of Christ if our temple has become dirty and dishonoring to God? So we need this, you need this, I need this. Jesus was, was disappointed in his people that now the temple had become corrupt. This was not true worship. Again, true worship is more than just singing songs and raising your hands. True worship is living a life of obedience to God. Can I get an amen in the house? We're coming up to the election time, aren't we? This is where, this is where the meanness usually comes out of the Christians. Some of you hate Biden. Some of you hate Trump. But you can't hate anybody and call what you do here worship. God, lay the ax to the root of anything and everything in my life that does not honor you. When we worship with a pure heart towards God, he inhabits our praise. Worship is like oxygen to the soul. It brings fresh hope and a renewed mind. Without true worship, somebody say true worship. Without true worship, our souls suffocate with guilt and misery and fear. Let me give you my third point. The temple is a place for God to dwell. And I want everybody to come to a fresh understanding today that your temple, if you're a follower of Jesus, say Amen. If you believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, say amen. amen. Then you're a dwelling place for God. And in that dwelling place, God desires it to be a temple. You're a temple. Somebody say, I'm a temple. God desires from your temple for it to be a house of prayer and true worship, not faux worship. Let me give you my third point. I know I'm kind of, I can have a few extra minutes because Kim took longer than, no, no. <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. Listen. So we might go just a couple minutes over. How many will give me 10 minutes? Just give me 10. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100. Bam, yeah, yeah, yeah. You fall for that every time. I want you to know that we value young families here at the Fount of Life. And thank you, Pastor Kim. I'm going to give you my final thought. A temple is a holy place. First of all, a temple is a place for God to dwell. A temple is a place for prayer and true worship. And finally, a temple is a holy place. And this temple that Solomon built, where Jesus went in and started flipping tables and tossing money on the floor and opening up pigeon cages and doves flying everywhere. The people running around like lizards, picking up coins, rolling all over the floor. It became anything but a holy place. The temple had become a place where worship was a machine, corrupted by greed and the holiness of God was lost.
And it's a sad statement. The holiness of God was lost. Just an example. It doesn't break this down in the text, but Jewish men, Jewish men had to appear three times a year in the temple. They were to bring their tithes, animal sacrifices. No Israelite man could come to the temple empty-handed. And when people would come to make their sacrifices, watch this. Corruption. It's like the godfather in operation. They would first come to the outer court. And they had to pay a temple tax. Before they even gave their tithes, they had to pay a temple tax. Hey, that's a good idea. How about, Brother Bob, we just have a, an entrance fee to come into the church. So they had to pay a temple tax to even come in. And anyone who possessed foreign currency had to have it exchanged. If you've ever traveled out of the country, you know the term exchange rate. Well, at the temple court, it was five to one. And the temple had become driven by greed. There was no giving to the poor. The Godfather had a monopoly on the sale of sacrificial animals too. Watch this. So when you brought your animal for sacrifice and they had to inspect it, every animal to be sacrificed had to be without spot and without blemish. And if your animal was not without spot or blemish, you had to buy one from the temple. How many of you think passed inspection? Not many would pass inspection, so they had to buy another animal from the temple, and those animals that were confiscated would be sold the next couple of days as animals without spot and blemish. It was corrupt. There was sin, there was deception, there was greed. The temple had become anything but a holy place. Jesus said, this is why he said this, my house should be called a house of prayer and you, he said, have made it a den of thieves. See, when Jesus was on trial, by the way, and I don't know about you, but if he called you a thief, I don't know, you might take offense to that. If you read on, go ahead and read Matthew chapter 23. And if I ever preached a sermon like that, nobody would come back. Jesus gave it all that last week. He says, you've made it a den of thieves. Listen, when Jesus was on trial, the people didn't yell, crucify him, because he was sweet, non-judgmental, tolerant, and affirming. They yelled, crucify him, because he claimed to be God. He called out sin, and he rejected what culture and religion had accepted. That's why they cried out, crucify him. So here's Jesus flipping tables and bags of money going everywhere. Pigeons and doves are flying away. Oh, by the way, this is the second time Jesus cleansed the temple. I don't know if you know this or not, but he cleansed the temple right after he turned water into wine. Don't miss this, please. Right after he turned the water into wine, he cleansed the temple. At the beginning of Holy Week, he cleansed the temple. It happens at the Alpha and the Omega of his ministry. And I wonder if he's trying to tell us something. And in John chapter 2, one of the disciples remembered that it was written about Jesus in the Psalms. Here it is. The zeal for your house has consumed me. The zeal for your house has consumed me. I want everyone to lean in. Lock in right here. Lock it in. There's a zeal in the heart of God for you. And it's a fire that burns in the heart of God for true worship and for true holiness in our lives. He's cleaning the temple. This is the one in John where he made a whip and he's like... (laughs) Different side of Jesus today. He's chasing them all out. Tables are going everywhere. He's got a whip chasing the ox and the sheep out. And the, one of the disciples remembered the zeal for his house has consumed him. What is the zeal of God for that house? Not that house anymore. Not the tabernacle. Not the temple. The zeal for your house. What is the zeal of God that burns like a fire in his heart? The zeal for God is that we would produce true worship and a life of holiness. The Bible says our God is a consuming fire. He is a light and in him is no darkness at all. 
There is not the slightest shade of indifference in the heart of God towards sin. What does all this corruption in the temple have to do with me? Or you? Glad you asked. Our temple can be corrupted as well by sin. I'd like to think that every Christian is just walking holy, 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 holy. But we live in a world where it's a sex-saturated society. Pornography is everywhere, and you don't even have to go to the dark side of town and slip into a back door in some sleazy building anymore. It's right there on your Facebook feed. Pot's legal now. Weed. I'm sorry. I lost everything. I saw it on TV one time. I just... And Christians today think because it's legal, it's okay. Listen, our temple can be corrupted when we tolerate sin. Our temple can be corrupted by anything that competes with the ways of Jesus. Lustful ways, selfish ways. As I said at the beginning of the message, more than fire can destroy a temple. Faux worship can destroy the temple. Sin that's tolerated and indulged in can defile the temple. Second Corinthians 7, 1 says this. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from the filthiness of the flesh. Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. 2 Corinthians 6.16 says this, what agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. And I think what he means by that, what agreement is there with the temple of God and idols? What agreement is there with the temple of God and anything that would compete with his holiness? We cannot mix the pollution of this world with the holiness of God. We cannot serve two masters. We will love one and hate the other or cling to one and despise the other. But Jesus said you cannot serve God and money. Something interesting happened on the day of Palm Sunday night. And we'll close with this. I've said that before though. And share this with you today. Let me say it again. Russ in here to beat us up. And God's plan for the Jewish people was to be a kingdom of priests that would demonstrate the glory of God to the nations around them. And God's plan is no different for you and I. It's to be a kingdom of men and women who honor God and can show the glory of God to those who don't know God around us. Are we together, everybody? And if we have fake worship that suffocates the soul, and if we indulge in things that just defile the temple, then not only are we not demonstrating the glory of God, we really break the heart of God in our own life. I mean, you can disagree with the Bible if you want, it's still right. right. Something happened on Palm Sunday night, and Pastor Kim and I were in the office Friday and we were going over some, by the way, I had a whole different Palm Sunday sermon. Reuben came in today and go, why are the slides all different? I'd rather share the other one. It would have brought you up out of your seats. Probably a lot of, been plenty of applause lines in it too. I stand here today to bring what the Holy Spirit put up my heart, so let's not call it a sermon. Sermons bore me. Call it a word from God on Palm Sunday, because everything Jesus did on Palm Sunday through Holy Week had significance, and it all points to us. In verse 11, Jesus went into the temple. Could you put verse 11 up one more time there, Olivia? Lock in, everybody. Jesus went into the temple, quietly looked around. This is the night. The parade's over. Palm branches have all been laid down. Donkey, back to its rightful owner. Jesus went into the temple the night before. He didn't clean house till the next day. 
He looked around. Pastor Kim looked up the word. She said the Greek word, which I can't pronounce, for looked around means to inspect the area critically. He wasn't just sight seeing. Jesus went into the temple. He quietly looked around. He said nothing. He did nothing. He walked into the temple, Palm Sunday night. He didn't flip tables. He didn't chase animals out. He didn't dump the money on the floor till the next day. I never saw this before. He just walked into the temple, all the same crap, sorry, is going on. The temple tax was being paid. The exchange rate was five to one. There was no giving to the poor. Oh, by the way, Solomon prophesied that the temple would allow Gentiles into worship, but they didn't let them in. There was no love in this temple for anybody other than for themselves. Jesus saw the religiosity. He saw the temple tax. He saw the Godfather operation going on with the animals being confiscated and sold the next day. And he saw the corruption, the sin, the deception, and the greed. He said nothing. And he did nothing. Please don't mistake God's silence for God's approval. What are some lessons we can take from this, brothers and sisters? Because you know what? Sometimes we indulge in things we should not. And nothing seems to happen. No lightning bolt struck me today. Guess I'm all right. Don't mistake God's silence for God's approval. What did we walk away with on this Palm Sunday? I know you'd rather wave palm branches and hear a real light me up sermon. I'd rather preach that one. But I believe God wants the people of the fountain of life and all of his people to be a kingdom of priests. Salt of the earth, light of the world. City set on a hill. Hallelujah. To be a city set on a hill, it cannot be hid. And Jesus was disappointed at the fig tree. There was no fruit. But he was more disappointed with his people because there was no fruit. And he goes into the temple and broken hearted because it's not what he had planned. What do we do? What do we do from here? I'll say it again, everyone who believes and has put faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ, you are the temple of God. Not this. God doesn't dwell in buildings made with hands. Heaven is his throne, earth is his footstool. How are you gonna fit God in a building? But he has come to dwell in the hearts of men. And maybe our temples need some cleansing today and maybe our fig tree needs some fruit. First John 1 John 1.9 says, this is the last verse I'll share. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. In a moment, I'm gonna ask Kurt team to lead us in a song, but So where do we go from here? What lessons do we learn? I believe we ought to respond. I believe the Holy Spirit wants us to respond this way. And that's when we repent of any faux, false worship. You know, faux seems like a better word than false, right? When you go to the store, it's faux leather, faux fur. It just sounds better than fake. Yeah, yeah. Anybody ever bought a full leather jacket? It sounds better than, here, I'd like to show you this fake leather. So we use faux. Maybe we repent of our false or fake worship. Rather than just singing songs, how about we leave here today and we live a life of obedience to God because that's greater worship than any song. 
And maybe we should repent of any greed in our lives and give to the work of God. Bring your tithes and stop stealing it and keeping it for yourself. Because when we don't give our tithes to the Lord, we really rob God. And how can we rob God and come in here and still worship? Let's be careful of materialism. Jesus talked a lot about greed and almost none of us think we're guilty of it. Maybe we ask God to show us where there's materialism in our heart. I don't know. I don't know. I just know I, I, know I want to be a, a priest of God. I know I want to be a representative of a holy God to a world that needs Jesus. And I desire with all of my heart that that be your desire. There's a zeal in the heart of God. There's a zeal. There's a zeal for you, for his house. What is it? For true worship and for holiness. So you can be a nation of priests. Perhaps you've come here today and you've never placed faith in the finished work of Jesus. You know that whole animal sacrificial system we talked about? It was just set up to teach us that when those animals die, that all sin deserves the death penalty. Animals died as a sacrifice to pay the penalty for their owner's sin. Simply put, our sin deserves our death. But instead, God arranged a substitute. I said, God arranged a substitute. And his name is Jesus. I knelt down here during worship and I just wept, Kurt. I sense the presence of God in my being so strong today. And I believe that the Lord is here among us, in us and among us. God arranged a substitute, his name is Jesus, on whom your guilt would be transferred. He would die in your place. Jesus is his name. And when you place your faith in him to save your soul, the moment you do, he comes into your life, into your spirit, and you will become a temple of God as well. And for the whole church who is the temple of God, let remind you, let me remind you that God's plan for you is to be a kingdom of priests, to have fruit on the tree, I said fruit on the tree. To worship in spirit and in truth. And to perfect holiness in the fear of God. It's time for us to worship in spirit and in truth. It's time for us to have fruit on the tree. It's time for us to rid ourselves of anything and everything that competes with the holiness of God. It's time for us to be a kingdom of priests who will minister the glory of God to the ends of the earth and to stand as a beacon of truth to a world that's confused and lost. That's why Jesus cleansed the temple. And he's here today to work in our hearts. I want us to worship. Please don't clap when I walk off this platform. Sometimes I clap and appreciate. I don't, it's not a time for applause. It's a time to seek the Lord. I know we're past time, but I got nowhere else to go today. And I, I don't know if you'd like to, I'd like to open the altar for you if you want to just come and kneel down or maybe you want to bow your head in your seat. The cursing of the victory, the cleaning of the temple was significant and it was pointing to us. Let us draw near to God today. Let us repent. And let us ask a holy God to cleanse us, wash us, purify us. So we might be a great light for a holy God to lead us.